from CO. Okay, CO in the chat, you don't unmute yourself. Starting in five, four, three, two, one. First of all, characterization of how the process looks, who the individuals are, then the principle, and then on the practical way, people are likely to win, and that's good for the community going forward and for the individuals who have already left. How is this process likely going to look like? Four points of framing. One, it is likely to be individuals in the adult stage for the reason that you know we can model that, but also that's when most people have the capacity to live. Two, it's probably a standardized legal procedure based on a change in legislation that says that the act of communities keeping you actively in or restricting you leaving or inflicting some sorts of harms is some amount of like civil offense that can be legislated. Three, oftentimes around this, insofar as there's pressure to help those disadvantaged by this community, insofar as companies want some sort of signaling, there's probably pro bonos, legal NGOs for disenfranchised people that give people some sort of access. I don't think financial is the reason why people don't affect it. Fourthly, I just think the process itself is likely to look like a civil lawsuit not a criminal lawsuit, insofar as a lot of these things are psychological harms or things of like restricting someone's agencies, which traditionally fall under that canon of the law. Two, who are the people trying to sue the religious communities? I think broadly, there are the minority of people in these groups that would be considered social pariahs, mainly because they have a legitimate belief that the community is not for them, and they've taken active steps to leave in the end period of them belonging to that community, and now as they have left. Why, why is it true of this? I think it's just because a function of the barriers of exit being relatively high. Oftentimes, you've been conditioned to live there. You've been told as a kid that this is the only space that's safe, that going outside is the damnation. So that means that A, few people consider this, but B, oftentimes the people that consider this to be this cognitive mechanism of its bad have been particularly abused in this community. They've been deprived opportunities to get education. They've been like inflicted sexism on them oftentimes when they're female. But three, they're considered pariahs within the community because they're going against base, basic uh, teachings. And finally, fourthly, I think these people are like likely to be the ones on the edge. Insofar as a lot of people don't have information on the outside world, you legitimately have to have a preference and some sort of harm to create it to you in the past to create that preference to actually inform yourself of the outside world when you're in a restricted community like this one. I'll take the clarification. In the case of the Amish that literally don't have money, phones, electricity, or internet, and they physically won't go to like the court. Will you mandate the police and the military to go to these places, take the people and put them in the court place? This is a serious clarification. So this is a serious clarification indeed. If it refers to the person suing, obviously they have left. So I assume the PI doesn't apply to them. But for like the Amish defendant or whatever they're called, oftentimes insofar as you need some amount of cooperation to get all the benefits and the government doesn't want the stupid policies, there's incentives to do the trial process as it relates to the community. For example, setting up a courthouse within the Amish community with some Amish representatives. Repeat and like adapt to like the specific preferences and quirks of every religious community just so you can get them to interact. I think this is like fair enough to model. Let's talk about the impacts of this motion. First of all, on the principle. What is the principle? When someone's agency is grossly violated or when significant mental harms are inflicted on them, which they can never consent to and all opportunities to consent to are removed from them, they have a principal right to some amount of recourse and saying this is wrong by, you know, having a trial which signals that it's wrong, a guilty verdict or just like social pressure from the trial indicating that what the community has done is something that it is, something that it is wrong. What is the nature of these harms? One. I think it's a rigid enforcement of gender norms. Oftentimes women are like in, in these communities are only like educated to like be childbearers and a lot of opportunities are taken from them. Two, the conditions are often not best for living. You're not given enough food as a trial of God. You're not given enough educational opportunities specifically so you don't leave. Three, there's a total lack of empowerment at the point where you don't get like intellectual opportunities. When you have some sort of initiative that goes against, someone tells you that you're a bad person and you can't do it. But four, oftentimes there's extreme rhetoric that makes you anxious. You're afraid of the outside world. You're told over and over again that damnation is likely if you don't do arbitrary rule X, and that hurts you. For all the people who consider leaving, insofar as I've characterized the barriers being big, the extent of all these individual harms, be, uh, individual harms occurring is to a large extent. Second part of this principle, why like the arbitrariness matters? 
and like they can never consent into it. Notice this is not the standard, ah, you're born in an arbitrary place. Because even if I was born in Romania or like Ruman was born in Bulgaria, we could have left at some point. You can move from a country. The difference with religious communities is A, the psychological mechanism that make you dread the outside world. B, the smallest instance of you trying to leave, you're punished, etc. So every opportunity to consent out of this community is actively removed. And that's the harm. There's active harms to the individuals and active attempts to prevent these individuals from escaping from this harm. This is wrong and can be rectified by, by other means because one, oftentimes when there's no specific legislation on the specific like pernicious actions that these communities do, it is hard to establish a burden of proof such that someone can have a successful trial where someone has enough evidence to start a trial. You need a change within the, commu within the community le legal norms in a country for you to be able to trial these things. Let's move on to the practical. Why you're likely to win a large majority of cases. Four things. One, it's a civil lawsuit. So oftentimes you have to prove beyond some uh, doubt and not beyond reasonable doubt. So it has to be like 51% when you have to convince most of the jurors. Two, oftentimes there's pr precedent. So like when this happens once, you also get more people who have escaped trialing because they see it as a way for catharsis. But two, there's like the legal precedent that makes each subsequent case easier to win because there's evidence in the past. Three, oftentimes, as I explained, there's organizations such as like Escape from Religion and stuff that will offer support for this. But four, I think it's relatively easy to prove these things insofar as the new legislation is likely to be specific. And as I've characterized, the harms are amounting to systematic oppression. What are the benefits? One, communities change. They do not turn into an echo chamber, but rather get more liberal. The reason is that if there are people on the edge leaving and they're seeing that the people who have left, because presumably the people communicating are like the ones that want to leave and the people and the people uh, leaving, oftentimes the community sees this as a risk. It could disrupt the community. There could be more pressure. And that's why they prefer liberalizing and like appeasing these people. And because oftentimes patriarchs in this community have uh, authority, they can pass things to liberalize. So for example, like the Amish community accepting people having phones and people started going out to work more outside of the community. But two, I think the communities also change to signal because civil society often presses you if you're too oppressive. And when these trials like express to wider society because it's a new development, you know, these communities are kind of bad. You don't want to be canceled. You don't like funding from donors or like from the museums you run as the image to go away. So you want to signal that you're relatively good. And that's why we get liberalization of the communities. Proud to purpose. Thank you, Prime Minister, following up on the opposition video. Thank you. Hi, am I audible? Yes, you are. Cool. My speech will start on my next word. I'd like to take a look at what the legal system actually looks like and the way in which this is most likely to play out. I think um, OG is probably right, right? When they say that a lot of these cases are going to be passed, but I'm going to explain why this is not even necessarily a good thing, not first and foremost for the religious, but secondarily for the way in which like lawmaking and precedent tends to work, right? I think I'd first like to outline that you can already sue for a lot of these things in civil courts, right? These are not exclusive to suing for like religious practices. For example, things like abuse and neglect, as you were outlining, things like not enough food or insufficient living conditions can already be sued for. These are things that are like legislated for fairly commonly and something that I don't exactly think falls within the scope of this debate. I think what probably does fall in within the scope of this debate is like mandated gender norms within like specific communities, like women having to be pushed into like specific careers or arranged marriages. I'm going to propose like a specific counterprop that I think deals with this much, much more effectively than um, like allowing like the suing of larger religious communities, right? I think first and foremost, right, I think specific legislation passed through states like executive and legislative branches, right, is just infinitely more able to tackle this for a lot of reasons I'll outline later, right? But I think what this looks like, right, is for like laws being passed are like no arranged marriages for people who are under the age of 18. A specific legislation that has to go through multiple forms of like checks and balances in and within that like community, right, rather than specific like legislation being passed through like suing precedent and civil suits, right? I think there are 
lot of issues with this, and these are what I'm going to be outlining, right? I think first and foremost, looking at who creates law and who has the capacity to like make judgments on these specific things, right? I think first and foremost, the way in which we like look at judges are just fundamentally not elected officials, right? Judges are people who are like essentially very, very successful lawyers or very, very successful people within the legal field or like law theologists, right? Who tend to do very, very well and therefore like rise up. They tend to be people who are a lot older. They tend to be people who are a lot conservative. And by just the way in which countries tend to work, tend to be part of whatever the majority religion is within like specific jurisdiction, right? I think this causes a couple of issues that I'll be getting into later, right? But I think the main one being the idea that they are not usually the most understanding nor charitable to like the specific thing going in, right? I think when you have, say, like a judge who is like an atheist or whatnot, I just do not think that that judge has the intention nor the capacity at most levels to fully understand and fully understand and fully comprehend a lot of like the cultural significances of like various like minority religions or isolationist communities like specific practices and like to what extent that these things are either like harmful or like I think just generally when you have not experienced this you are just like less likely to understand it I also think this is specifically impactful right in states that have like somewhat like oppressive governments right not like ones that function outside of like a democracy I promise I'm still like within debate land but like specifically states that have a majority religion and is somewhat oppressed minority religion in within that right I think it is in the incentives of like judges and higher ups who do tend to be part of the majority religion to look uncharitably or at the very least there are social narratives within their circles that that like make it more likely that they will look uncharitably upon these like smaller religions right and are more likely to legislate harshly against them right why is this like specifically bad right i think the person by og's characterization is just likely to be a social pariah is someone who's likely to be somewhat excluded from the community by the very nature of the fact they are suing the community in and of themselves right so this is someone who is unlikely to advocate for like the smaller practices or like new practices because they feel like something has been personally harmed to them right if anything i think they are more if anything, I think they are like more likely to feel like as if they want harsher legislation because it is in a moment of time that has like a greater degree of like trauma and issue for them, right? I think because of this, similarly, when you have the judge who will similarly not sympathize, who you're like, who is representing the interests of this group in a way that like preserves culture and a way that is understanding of this culture, right? I think the counterpoint deals with this fairly effectively, I think. See when it is at the very least better that you legislate against these practices through something that is more organized body. When you go through like an executive legislative branch, you're more likely to get a committee researching a specific piece of legislation and the way in which it impacts cultural values. When you're inside a courtroom, when you're making precedent, it's likely to last for the next case after that and the 30,000 cases that come after that in the next coming years. It's something that is, first of all, very difficult to take back unless you just have like a much larger case which first of all just costs an awful lot of money if you're trying to reverse that precedent but secondarily i think that the, the state the specific legislation that is likely to have a specific precedent that occurs as a result of this is just likely to be harsher in regards to like preserving cultural interests i think i think the impacts of this are fairly obvious right i think at the point of which you have like very high up officials being able to dictate what isn't is not acceptable cultural practices because note something that is a harm as per the words of the motion is actually very very hard to define right this is why we have like years and years of legal precedent and still issues arise right this is why law is actually a field and not a set of legislation right i think the courts having less capacity to define whether or not like a specific cultural practice is a harm or not is probably not a good thing when the people trying to decide whether or not these things are a harm will intuitively believe it is a harm from first instance by virtue of a person telling them that it is right but I think secondarily, how are these religious groups likely to react to this? Because I do not think the likely comparative is they become more liberal, right? I think the likely comparative is it becomes like more isolationist, right? When you start to see the, 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 the state as a more oppressive actor, when you start to see that the minute people go outside the community, bad things happen to the community, I think the way in which these like us and them narratives work within these isolationist communities, the way in which like you have matriarchal or patriarchal narratives, right? The, your religious leader or your religious figure is likely to now point to this as a another example of if you go to the outside bad things will happen if you leave this community bad things will happen to your family because now we have to like pay up a bunch of money because so and so did that right I think specifically when harm is very hard to define and you have as I proved earlier just greater capacity for like larger crackdowns in the way in which like legal precedent is made right I think it is more likely the narratives of the community shift to anyone going outside anyone moving any interaction with like the state as a whole right is something that is wholly negative all it takes right because as OG says 
there is just likely for lots of them to win. I don't think this is, first of all, necessarily a good thing with a like oppressive, when you have like governments that are like somewhat oppressive, right? But even in like general instances, right? All it takes is one specific person with a personal vendetta against someone else for this legal precedent to be set when the judges are just less likely to be charitable towards that specific community, right? I think what this looks like, right, is communities just cracking down on a lot on like a lot of any kind of like more liberal or like more like in or more cohesive with society or, uh, policies right i think what this is more likely to look like as communities becoming more and more isolationist making the all of the harms that like og wants to claim about all these communities doing these bad things to the people just amplify a lot more when you have less communication with the outside world i think any individual who was able to escape this community in adult who is now less likely to be able to do so because there are now more measures in place telling them that this is a horrible horrible idea and their families are going to get fucked over if they do right i just think like secondarily when you have a lot of very coercive structures within this and it's very very careful to not try and like you know hit the hornet's nest and make it a whole lot worse right is that time i think that's time <laughs> thank you leader of opposition calling upon the deputy prime minister here thank I just checking. Am I audible? Yes, you are. Great. Um, POIs in the chat, please. I'm going to deal with opening opposition in several ways to first take them out of the debate, and then I'll reintroduce to you the material Stefan brought to you and explain why uniquely it's winning us the round. The first thing I want to respond to in terms of opening opposition's case is just dealing with their attempt at trying to co-op the benefits of helping individuals who may want to sue these communities. Ellis has set up. You can sue these individuals for things like physical harm, things like sexual and physical abuse. But the problem with this response, which Stefan already preempted in his speech, was that there's a very high evidentiary burden of proof that is quite difficult for you to meet on the side of opening opposition for the simple reason that if these communities definitionally are pretty isolated, there's very little legal oversight into what are the actions specifically ongoing in these communities. Things like abuse can't be tracked because it happens behind closed doors. If you're physically abused as a child, it's quite difficult for you to prove that you did experience this as an adult because, for example, the bruises might no longer be there or, you know, you've passed the statute of limitations. This is why opening opposition can't come up and say that we can also have these things on our side. You can't just easily co the benefit of an individual because the nuance we gave to you was that by expanding the categories in which you can have a civil lawsuit for, it is far easier for you to win cases because you win it on a balance of probabilities. Even if it's some arbitrary harm of being raised in a problematic way, that is far easier to prove than the tangible harm of physical abuse. But I also want to deal more uniquely with their counterfactual here. Their alternative to things like expanding the categories in which you can sue for is rather we should legislate from the top down. Why is What is the problem behind this? Two main things. One, I think this is exactly what mobilizes the very problematic narratives that these communities already have, that the state is further imposing the beliefs onto us if they now created this new blanket law and we're meant to follow it. Because one, it's divorced from our beliefs. We never consented to this. And I think this is what gets far worse on their side. Because note, civil lawsuits happen on a step-by-step -step basis. It's not just all of your community members who were abused leaving at one point in time. It happens over, let's say, a period of five to 10 years. Comparatively, things like legislation is imposed from the top down. You see the impact far more, which is, I think, what causes way more harm in, sorry, which causes way more fear in these communities. The second response I want to make is that they accuse that the individuals who are going to be adjudicating these cases on our side are just like overly unfair to which these communities because they're completely divorced from understanding how they work. One, I don't think opening opposition knows how these bodies work to begin with, right? If anything, I'd say that the judiciary is far more impartial than a random politician or legislator drafting bills for the very simple reason that the judiciary doesn't have a political agenda behind the things they do in court. Comparatively, politicians need to do things like toe the party line. I think they're far more predisposed to having their biases manifest 
because they can justify being partial because you know they have a party agenda or a manifesto to live up to. Comparatively, judges are literally trained to be impartial. If you're shown to be partial in your judgments, that is the point in which you know you get things like disbarred from the judiciary because you're not fulfilling your role as a judge. The second and more crucial response I want to make here is they say that ah, judges are going to be atheists and they'll do things like discriminate against their communities. I'd like to note. A lot of judges in the UK are Christians, but at the same time, they have the ability to do things like be impartial in decisions. I don't think it's that difficult to separate your personal beliefs from the way you adjudicate cases. I think opening opposition is just hyperbolizing the problem here. But even if you don't buy this response, I think these individuals are far more worse on opening opposition side. Because when you have the racist Tories developing bills, for example, to deal with religious isolated communities, I think the biases are more likely to manifest in bills because, you know, you have things like group thing, which allows you man like biases to just like go unchecked but what is far worse is that you don't have the counter check and balance that you otherwise would have in the judiciary the third response i want to make here is regarding their like counter characterization as to why the community reaction is going to be one of increasingly like people retreating into echo chambers i just like to note at the top of this response that this just does not engage at all with the nuance that stefan brought to you what does stefan say to you one the harm is something gradual right so as i hinted to earlier it is not a mass exodus of individuals leaving the Amish community, for instance, but rather it's several individuals over a graduated period of time. You see the uncle who you once were very close to now no longer be a member of the community because he's departed. The friends you talked to as a child no longer talk to you now because they've moved on from these communities. These are the things you see. It's not so much that a hundred people just leave one day and you don't know what happens to them. What this means then is that the level of fear that's being sown in these communities is relatively minimal because you don't see the scale of impact happen in such a short duration of time. But the more important nuance we gave to you was that departures cause disruption to begin with because you're messing around with people on the fringe. And note, the way in which these isolated communities work is that they rely on power in numbers. As it is, they're pretty small to begin with, which is why even if one individual leaves, that is a massive threat to their communities. And I think that is why they're more likely to do things like liberalize. And it's just empirical evidence of this happening in the status quo to begin with, right? Like the Amish community community in its intuition swore to lay off all modern technology because it was a sin and it tempted the human desire. But like they literally use some mobile phones to an extent in the status quo. They use more modern farming equipment despite it not being something that they're supposed to do. So I think it's shown that these communities do have an incentive to trend to liberalize if there's a harm to the community. And the only way in which they can captivate people to stay is if they give them more freedom to begin with. That is the benefit we brought to you that can only happen on our side. But before we rebuild the case, sure, see you. I didn't like the answer to my clarification. You don't have the fiat to set up courts internally. And even if you do, who will do all of the things that you're talking about if the courts are internally? If it's not internally, like the way you analyzed, are you okay with the military going in and taking these people? Please okay, answer okay. this. Well, like I don't think we need to resort to the military coming in and getting these people out to begin with. One, you can do things like issue court subpoenas and note, if it is true, as CEO characterizes that, ah, these communities are so poor, you can literally be found in contempt of court if you don't show up to a case to begin with, the criminal penalties imposed on these communities, I think that's a natural aversion to not want to have these things imposed onto you, which is why they're going to show up. And CEO just can't come up here and argue that, ah, this is an illegitimate imposition of values because of the nuance I'm going to give you in the final bit. I'm going to explain why it's more legitimate to prioritize the choice to leave compared to the choice to like stay in like exclusion, right? One, this choice to stay in exclusion relies on the condition that the method of raising children was actively harmful to them. And the parallel I want to draw here is things like parental rights in the status quo. The state allows and entrusts full autonomy to raise kids by their parents unless there's harm to the child. And I think insofar as we've proven that there is a harm that these individuals have experienced, it is legitimate to intervene in that instance. But secondly, and more importantly, the avenues to mitigate harm are far less available for victims because for the plaintiffs, Stefan already explained to you why it's already quite difficult for you to leave. Even if you do leave, you don't have the financial agency to do things like live off your life. But for the communities, maybe another individual leaves, but it doesn't take much for you to minimally update your practices. The harm isn't as massive as Op would like to believe for those reasons, vote OG. Thank you, DPM, calling upon DL. Uh, 
Um, okay, starting my speech in three, two, one. Firstly, some responses to what we get from the DPM. Firstly, they tell us that like um, the sort of legislation, our counterpart, but with like government by the government passing specific laws to protect individual issues rather than just having several lawsuits. They say that this is bad because there is a higher burden of proof that these acts actually happened. And so you're less likely to get the justice principle that they claim to get. I think this is um, not important for a few things. Firstly, I think a high burden of proof and these level of lawsuits is not necessarily a bad thing, right? Because I think if you're trying to say that somebody has literally like abused or neglected or put a lot of harm to onto you, you should have to prove that. Otherwise you can just get false claims that are not fair and then and they're therefore more hurtful and you are not getting justice. Therefore there's less injustice and there's there's less justice, there's less retribution, and you're not there, you're not receiving the principle um, that OG claimed that they achieve. I think secondarily, they're like um I think se secondarily they tell us that like, oh, they um the government sorry the government is going to be more um impartial than the, the government is going to be more biased than any individual judiciary i think we need to look at the level of checks and balances between a government creating legislation and specific um like judges or specific civil um civil laws or several like precedent and um, i think firstly like when the government creates legislation, there's lots of checks and balances just because it's just more widely known. It needs to get passed through different levels of government. It needs to get passed through different groups of people that are made up of many political parties because not many um, political parties have every single seat of the one party. I think they, um, therefore you're likely to get more accountability on the legislation that is passed so that it is both specifically important and specifically relevant. And you're likely to get more accountability if these policies are bad. I think, um, Therefore, what you achieve is you achieve like better legislation that correlates to specific harms. I think this is two things. Firstly, I think that it makes it easier for cases like cases to happen and um, when there has been an actual injustice because you have a legitimate harm in government and law that you can say happened to you rather than you just having to say, oh, this, this, I was like treated poorly. There's a case in the past that was also treated poorly. And then you have a judge who at the end of the day is only one person they're going to come in with their own biases they're going to come in with their own opinion or even if it's like like a jury they're still just it's not as like certain as if you have a literal legislation that you can point to and you say they did this this is against the law compared to like you just suing for like oh i didn't you know like i feel like i wasn't treated very well and i think therefore like you're going to get less bias case you're going to get more justice of outcomes so i think then Onto like what this sort of LO told us. I think they they have this idea of like, like when you, when in their case, you're going to end up with like more liberal communities. First, I don't think they ever mechanize what communities, these sort of isolated be communities becoming more liberal is necessarily good. They tell us they get phones in there and stuff. I'm not sure why I care about them getting phones in there. I'm not sure why I don't value their culture, why I don't respect their practices, why mine necessarily my way of thinking and my beliefs are necessarily any better than theirs. I don't think they mechanize this in a way or, or like impact this in a way of actually telling me why it's going to be good for an individual person. I think we should we should um, look after cultural practices. We should respect cultural practices. And I don't think we achieve that um, when we're like forcing communities to get more liberal. But I don't actually think they do get more liberal because I think like, I think it, the more likely option is that they just crack down. I think the um, OG tell us, okay, they, they'll crack down more if they see the government making legislation. But I don't know that that's necessarily true. Because at first, I think, again, it's just sort of the like lack of internet access of like, they're not massively aware of what's going in, going on in the outside world. When they do become well, where they do become aware is when the government or where the police are coming into their own individual community and telling them, oh, this person said that you've like, you lied to them about what the outside world was like you, or you like sort of um you you were not very nice to them i think that's when they become actually aware of like the 
harm there is of like what the outside world is thinking of them and what, what like is happening when people are leaving I think that is when they push down more because I think they char characterize that they're already like massively pushing down but I would say like at the minute the Amish are allowed to leave and like when they reach 18 or something they're take a year out if they want to leave they can leave I think when they find out that everybody who is leaving is now trying to sue them on, on these general lawsuits without a specific like actual necessarily like a mass without a specific action with just like a general oh you you know you treated me poorly or like you lied about me out the outside world I think that's when they become like more um more cracked down um and like more like that uh yeah I'll take the POI from OG yeah so we'd already told you the value of liberalization is that more people who are oppressed are empowered to leave you can continue to defend the preservation of culture but it also comes with the imposition of gender norms the fear mongering that exists and just the general suppression of autonomy that is quite bad for the individuals in these communities firstly i don't think that you necessarily proved things becoming more liberal means more people are allowed to leave i think you just tell me that okay if people are like being sued if the community is being sued then like oh okay they're not going to do that anymore everyone's going to leave but I think you neglect the actual ideology of these communities these communities a lot of the time parents don't do the things they do to their children because the majority of people don't want to hurt their children they don't want to hurt their own community they do it because that is truly what they believe to like get them to heaven that's truly what they believe is the right way of life that's truly what they think is right i think you're not going to because you're scared of getting lost you're not going to sacrifice your child and allow them to do what you believe is going to go to hell i think you're going to make them more isolated because you still want them to go to heaven and so you have to like isolate them even more from the outside world so they don't even know what's a possibility not to right i think you tell me like okay losses are going to make them more liberal giving away more ability to leave also again i don't know why it's necessarily like that brilliant of a thing like i think if people like parents and communities should be allowed to have the ideologies they have and they shouldn't necessarily have to always be being compared to the like outside world i think fear mongering gets worse and i think the demonization of the community gets worse when you just when they just become more and more isolated so i think the legislation we get is both like better better able to be like specific and better be able to be pulled on when needed and like secondarily i think um these communities become like are don't become more unsafe and they become like they don't become more isolationist um thank you thank you Thank you, Diana, calling upon the yeah. member of government here, here. And um, uh, so I was wondering uh, how how long is the speech? And um, seven minutes and fifteen seconds is the time. Okay. Okay, my speech starts now. Um, so I first of all would like to uh, respond to the um, opening opposition's argument point about um, false claims. Um, so as um, so there, um, this issue is with not not only with um, an issue of, um, in this case, but with uh, all essentially all cases that um, we, we have to balance um, balance and the benefits and costs um, between and the the um, the um, possible false claims. And the and the protection afforded to uh, to the uh, com members of the community, and so uh, as 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 an uh, op opening government uh, says, uh, the harm is not caused uh, uh, overnight, and it's it's called it's uh, it lasts over a period of five to ten years, and um, so um, in this regard, it is very difficult um, to. Um, uh, to prove the uh, the pr prima facie case um, to uh, to a certain extent, so evidence may uh, may be gone may be gone, um, uh, once uh, once time passes. And so uh, so what's what's good and what's uh, what's uh, uh, so what it, what so why is an why is a legislation necessary in this case? And so uh, um so a legislation may allow um, the cases um that involve certain facts. To be brought to be brought up, um, when, so essentially we would re reverse the burden of proof, um, in in some in, in some issues, so as to um, afford pr more protection to individuals of the community. So so this may have some implications for the 
um, for the community as a, um, on the whole, but, but the community can also adapt to this new legislation and um, to, um, to ensure that um, their, mem their members um, are, not, um, are, are not treated in, in a dehumanizing way. And so, um, so I would claim that the uh, the protection given to individuals of the community would outweigh the um, the possible uh, and the possible costs and and and, the, and by the false claims. So the second point I would like to raise is that, as as open government says, the legislation would be a top down um, approach to this issue. So what this means is that. Uh, so the government would put, would um, would spend more efforts, resources, and um, to um, to delve into this issue, and so to to find out what's go what's going on, right? What's going on there? And what cause or what what damage that um, um, a, a member of the community may may suffer, and what and what are the possible um, remedies to the to these harms? So as as um, as as an uh, opening government says. It is very costly and difficult for for one individual to prove this and to prove this harm and the causation um, in the court. But as with legislation, um, the government can systematically research um, this area, and so so uh, an individual do not does not have to prove it in the court. Um, so I think I'll take the POI from uh, Zoe. So, yeah. When communities all know each other and the person who left is demonized after a civil suit, what happens to the other people in the group with similarly liberal ideas of leaving? Uh, so as I said, um, as I said, the legislation would be a systematic uh, approach to this issue. So we will we'll, we'll research this issue on, on, a, on, a top, on a top on top down level so that um, the so that the an individual in the community would not um, bear so uh, bear the uh, the heavy burden of proving. And so th th this will this will also connect to my third point. And so my third point would be uh, that um, the, the the introduction of the legislation would help the community uh, to change its uh, lifestyles so that their lifestyles would not cause as much. As much damage to their to their members as as uh, what would be what would be the case without such a legislation. So as as opening government already said that the Amish Amish lifestyles are not immutable. Um, so, and so some communities have have and somehow adapted to and have uh, adapted and embraced uh, modern technology, um, because they are they are beneficial, not not harmful to their um, community as a whole. So similarly, with the introduction of a legislation, um, so if if a legislation if the leg if, if the legislation says something is harmful for uh, the community for the for the members of the community, then the community on the on the top um, on a higher level can change its lifestyles uh, on a systematic way so that the, the damage would not occur. Um, so the so this compared uh, compared with with uh, one individual bringing civil 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 suits in the, in the court, um, uh, so one once one suit one lawsuit in the court will not cause a systematic change to the lifestyle of the community, but a legislation will will do. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, member of government, calling for member of opposition. We're here. Ah, uh, hi. Am I audible? Yes, you are. Great. I'll take uh, POIs in the chat. Please don't unmute yourself. I'll take CO probably around the fifth minute. All right. Panel, I really am ashamed to admit this, but I'm a big Amish nerd. I, I watched a lot of documentaries about these things, so I kind of have a lot of spec on this. So many of the things that I'll say are facts. I'll also provide structural reasons for them. But please believe me, because I've spent uh, too much time, a uh, shameful amount of time watching this stuff. So what is the practical top half clash? Opening government says, currently the situation is bad and these communities are very conservative. This will change once you're allowed to sue them. Opening opposition says, currently the situation is good and it will become worse. What are the reasons as to why one is true versus the other? Opening opposition point to the argument 
but don't necessarily prove it. And they have two burdens to prove. The first is why in the status quo it is good. And secondly, why it gets bad. They do have some lines of this, but I don't think it is sufficient. So let's first start with the characterization where opening opposition stops at the end of the dialogue. They point to the concept of room springa. This is when, when the Amish, when they have 18 years old, they are not just allowed. They are mandated by their local community to go out for one year to experience the outside world in order to see for themselves and to make an informed choice. Now, opening government says, this is not the characterization. There is fear margin, there is things like that. You have no way to adjudicate this other than looking at the logical structural reasons that are behind this. Opening opposition don't provide structural reasons, we will do. So why is room spinning a likely? The first most basic reason is that in many of the cases, the leaders are competent and good people who want to give liberalization to their population. Why is this true? Because if we're talking about literally a small community of 100, 200, 300, 500 person people, the probability of a revolt or a mutiny against you is very likely, right? All it takes is 50 guys to get together, to not agree with you and to kill you at night and become, how do you say, the power in this particular case, you know, because it's not a country where you have thousands of people and you can have a private militia and things like that. You're literally in a village together and and because you fear this, you preemptively want to liberalize as much as you can in order to appease the general population and in order to seem like you're doing a good thing. But secondly, these communities may be isolated, but they're not completely isolated. Intuition pump. There are documentaries about this that are hours long, interviews with these people. The external world has some communication with these people, not full communication. Obviously, they don't have phones or internet, but they have had some interaction with outside people who have told them about planes, about cars, and about things like that, which generally creates a curiosity within individuals about this, about the modern world, about how much it has advanced, and about whether these things are actually real or not. Humans are very curious creatures, and they demand to go outside. That's why this was mandated. This concept of Ruspringa exists in order to apprehend this curiosity. But thirdly, in order for you to build a complementary and good communitarian uh, system where we are religious and we're all working together, you need buy-in from people. You need people to believe that they have a free choice. In order for people to believe they have a free choice, they have to go outside, experience the world, understand that it's bad, and return back. These are actual structural reasons as to why the current status quo is good. They dispel the government characterization and they prove Rospringa for uh, opposition. Not all opposition did not talk about these things. So this birth of the burden is exclusively ours. What do then they say? Ah, you're likely to do worse things. You're likely to crack down on people, create us versus them narratives and things like that. Why is this likely? There are two reasons as to why this is likely. And then I'll also respond to opening government's characterization. The first is that this is a significant harm that might happen to you. Not as a point of POIs. These communities literally do not have money they don't have currency. They don't operate within this. They operate on a barter system. So if they get sued and they have to pay $5,000 or $50,000, where are they going to get this money from? They have to sell off their cattle. They have to sell off their things. This may very well mean the destruction of their community. So the economic harm is uh, very high. But even if the economic harm doesn't happen, People still have to go to the courts, as we've outlined. They have to take from their time to physically go to these places. This is expensive. You have to buy bus tickets, plane tickets. You have to go there. And not if most of the labor that you're doing is manual, farming, ironing, all of these type of things, then you not being able to work in this means that you might have a good harvest, means that you might not have food on the table. I mean, this is extreme harm. But secondly... Uh, in this opening opposition, do point this out. Like, if you are subpoenaed, you may go to jail, you fear jail. But why do you feel jail? Because these people may not literally know what jail is. To them, male jail doesn't exist. It's maybe a very foreign concept where they are jailed, the liberties are taken and they're with a bunch of other random people that might harm them. What is the, What does this prove? This proves to you that these people are likely to view this as an extreme cost and an extreme risk to them happening in this particular case. Now, opening government respond by saying, ah, but if your people leave, then you are likely to liberalize instead of being like this. But if the risk is on you and you are the leader and you control all of the levers on power and directly harms you, uh, you have an egotistic incentive to not do this. But secondly, your community is also harmed because all these economic mechanisms directly harm to the community, so they're unlikely to realize they're likely to be risk averse and crack down on this. But I have another way to respond to their liberalization point. Trivially, these communities have very high birth rates. They can make more people. This is an empirical fact. It is true because of the conservative nature of their religion, right? When they're marry ugly and when they're marry young and they do all of these things, meaning that they don't care if a bunch of people leave, if they have other people that do so substitute down the line. What they do care about is not having money and not having the time to work on their harvest and things like that. This proves that why it is more likely than not that they'll turn to more conservatism rather than liberalization. I will weigh this off against the opening government uh, harms, but before I told you. 
Yeah, so the problem is if the legal costs are so big and it takes time to have kids, it takes time to make the laws bigger. Your proximate incentive when the cost is tied directly to the oppression sure. stops at oppression, much like when you find a company. The assertion, the the assert I, I agree. The assertion is that many people will sue and effectively sue. Many people won't sue. The reason many people won't sue is that many people believe that this is a good system. They have been brought up to the system. Their family is there. They have received benefits. This is their moral system. Some may sue right? Individual situations may sue and the risk and the harms of these individual situations are so big or at least big in the heads of these people that they would still do the things that we're talking about. Meaning that your mechanism doesn't activate because there isn't enough people that are suing, but our mechanism in terms of risk does activate in this case. Why is this harmful? I'd like to give you two straight wings in this case. The first wing is if there is no room spring up, if you crack down on this, if you stop doing this because it's too risky, then all of the people who would otherwise experience the real world no longer experience the real world because you've now turned more inward to this. This means that these people don't have a freedom of choice. This means that these people don't care about these things and they're numerically much more than the individual people that are likely to sue as we've proven to. But secondly, at best, you can only mitigate the harms that are done to you. Let's say opening government is completely right and there are people who now receive tons of money because they've been indoctrinated. This still doesn't take away the harm. I'm sorry, it's hard to hear, but it still doesn't take away the harm. It just mitigates. All of the future people who now won't have the capacity to experience the real world, who now won't have the capacity to opt out because they don't have the Rumstringa as an option, who now don't have these things, they will still be locked into this system. They will still be harmed and they will not know that there is a way out. This harm is much greater and we should care about these future people because it is irreversible to the thing that happens to them, whereas at least one uh, can be mitigated. For all these reasons, oppose. Thank you. Member of opposition calling upon government. Here, here. Um, is this my, my turn to speak now? Yes, government CG2. Okay, okay. Sure, I can speak for seven minutes. Am I right? Yes, seven minutes, and you have to wrap up within 15 seconds. Okay. By opening the speech, I firstly, I would rebut the point raised by the last speaker. After that, I will give a summary of both sides and, and to prove how, why we are burden of, why we can prove the case much better, in a much better manner, in a much more comprehensive manner. Firstly, regarding the point raised by the extension speaker of the closing opposition, he mentioned about the, the members' general ignorance of the procedure. He, he contended that there would be only individual members would come forward. And they would, if they, as, meanwhile, if they were isolated from the modern world, they would be very fearful of the procedure and therefore they would be, that they, they would be off putting. And moreover, he also contended, he also doubted about their capabilities of shooing or, or, or launching legal procedures. He 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 argued that their economic improv that, that because they were economically impoverished, they couldn't they they were unable to launch any lawsuits in a, in a meaningful sense. For this point, I would I would relate the point. I would rebut the point by saying that we should we must pay attention to the extraordinary nature of this proposal. This extraordinary proposal allows a member of communities to turn against the hierarchies under which they are raised. And I, I must concede that if this proposal is going to be executed, the government must be very interventionist. The government must be very supportive of, the, of this proposal. And as a result, if the government is to enforce this legislation or it is to enforce this proposal, they must give active support, both economically and legally, to these members of the communities. So I don't think, uh, so if these members of communities are actively supported by subsidies or pro bono legal help by the government or by other charities who are also supportive of this enterprise, I don't see why they cannot launch any lawsuits. And this this related back, and actually this area of clash relates to our character characterization of this debate, because the, the opposition is obsessed with how with with the abilities of the the, the opposition 
is very obsessed with the collective nature of these communities. They think that we sh the government or the modern world in, the, in general should not impose our own normative values of culture. We should not impose our mainstream culture on these communities. And they think these communities, these communities in a whole, in a whole, must be respected at all costs. However, we should separate these members from the communities. We should appreciate that these members do have some autonomy or to have some capabilities of evaluating what their communities mean to them. And we should, and that's that's support and this. The dichotomy supports the point raised by the opening government that only those who are perceived as pariah or who are, only those who are deprived of opportunities reshoe those communities. And I think we should give some respect to their to their individual individual freedom. Moreover, and moreover, as the the opening opposition always argues that. We should legislate in, instead of allowing lawsuits for them to show their communities. However, I, I, I argue that this point is of minimal importance to this debate, because in this debate, we are arguing whether we should allow them to show their communities, but legal lawsuits can either be authorized by legislation or by common law practices. And if the opposition has placed too much emphasis upon the upon the harms of common law legal common law lawsuits, then their point is, is is misplaced, and that's why that's also explain why we endorse legislation because we are talking about the principal correctness of the topic. We are talking about how the government or how different cultures should be should interact with each other instead of talking about the liberalization point and if too much emphasis has been placed on cultural autonomy or placed on the point of liberalization the the the, the focus the or the fulcrum of the debate will be misplaced or will be mischaracterized and therefore if these differences are not clarified or if we we are too obsessed with cultural autonomy, then, then we will confuse the autonomy of individuals with the autonomy of different religions. With regards to this point, I think our opening government has correctly identified that this religion has denied the opportunities or capabilities of those individuals. And we should therefore have more a more clear appreciation of the nature of these so-called religions, of these so-called communities, and why they are so isolated. And in this point, I think our I think the government has has run the burden of proof because our government the government has correctly characterized the nature of the problem and then the remedies of the problem. And unlike the opposition, which has which has made a lot of generalizations about liberalization, and the, the and they have they have also have they have an erroneous conception of lawmaking, and that's why we, the government should win this debate instead of the opposition because of our more objective and more comprehensive point, or evaluation of the extraordinary nature of this problem. Thank you, Government. Calling upon Dr. Chen. Hey, um, I wasn't here at the beginning, but I do consent to recording my speech just to mention that. I'll take POIs in the chat, please. Thank you. I think that it was telling when the government whip said that side government wins this debate as opposed to CG, because closing government's case is entirely derivative of opening government, and where it isn't, it is just mitigation to OO. I don't think that you could weigh them seriously in this round. 
in terms of consideration against the harms that Rumen brings you. With that said, I think that it becomes a debate of three teams. I'm going to go into opening opposition first, just in terms of weighing. Our claim from closing opposition was that we take a lot of money from these communities, that they're currently fairly liberal because of their leaders being clever and not wanting backlash, because of past interaction with the outside world, because um, it, it facilitates your faith in religion. And also, now you stop access to the real world, which is bad, and you preemptively indoctrinate people, which is also difficult. The reason why this beats opening opposition is as follows. They have two claims. The first is that legal systems are structurally unsympathetic with detached judges who are atheists or whatever. The problem with this is that they never show the comparative, i.e. the responses from OG are quite good here. Why are legislators actually good? Additionally, they don't show they have the political capital to even fiat this solution in the first place, given that this seems like a larger scope of change than just allowing people to sue. So it's unclear why this point can even stand in the debate. But secondarily, their argument, which is the um, which is also given the, the headline of you make these communities worse, is just not explained, right? They never tell you why these communities were even reasonably okay in the first place. As such, it is not an internally comparative point. Only Ruman with his three mechanisms explains why they are and gives the empirical grounding behind that. But also, secondarily, their, ex their harm in OO, which is not proven by mechanisms, but asserted, if you believe it at best, is that you like tell people that they should believe their religion more. However, the extent of this harm is not shown. However, our unique harm is you just don't let people access the outside world, which is something which is incredibly totalizing, because it robs all future frame of reference such that you're able to like defect and leave this community. We think that the uh, on the claim from opening government, which is that you need to allow people liberalization so they have the agency to opt in and out, the greatest agency to opt in and out is information, which is to say we allow people to know whether they want to opt in or out which means that on this metric of like a principal justification we're beating them and on the practical claim we're also beating opening opposition that's not the extent though of my weighing against opening government because the the way this opening government is, they reasonably prove that some people who leave these communities are going to be able to sue and are going to be able to get money. We think this is probably quite fair. We think that our claim on how you have less ability to access the outside world beats them for three broad weighing reasons. The first one is mentioned by Ruman, which is just the uniqueness and resolvability of the harm, which is to say that people who have already been hurt by the religious community can't have that pain taken away from them, that trauma. They can't forget those hungry nights when they were younger. However, people who are not allowed to go out into the future cannot access these benefits. The second weighing metric I want to introduce is just scale. Most people don't sue for three reasons. Firstly, it's awkward because you need to sue like your family and people who are close to you like your friends. Secondly, it's risky because you need to invest money into it, which you could lose. Thirdly, you don't see what you, this indoctrination is wrong because you were told from a young age that it was entirely right. Notice, they take the benefit away from all of the people who might leave as opposed to the few who might sue. They frame at the top of their first speech in PM that very few people do it. And as a result, on scale, we think this wins. The third way metric is just intensity, which is to say you can get compensation in other ways, like you can get money for different sorts of civil suits. You can get support from crisis NGOs, but you can't get this sort of unique access to the outside world on our side of the house, which means that the intensity of that benefit is never able to be matched. With this said, I'm just going to respond to opening government for the next like, I don't know, three and a half minutes, because I think that um, we're already beating them, but this just increases the margins. Their claims on um, insularity versus liberalization are as follows. You don't get insular because the harm is gradual. Notice, the, har the harm is in extremely intense. They say that it's gradual because not everybody leaves at once, and also because people who already leave already harm these communities. We think these communities are firstly quite poor for five structural reasons. A, they don't engage meaningfully in the formal economy, which means that they don't have like jobs. B, they don't get aid from larger churches. The reason why is because they're sects. They're literally against religion. They've broken off from the larger churches, which means that you're not going to give them money and encourage this if you're like the broader Catholic church. You're not going to give it to one of your smaller Westboro Baptist church or something like this. The third reason is the people who leave don't send back remittances because they're angry with the church. This is framed by opening government. The fourth is that they don't get loans because they're expected a priori to be unable to pay back and to be unstable as for the previous mechanisms I've given. The fifth is that they have no need to save or invest because they don't prioritize worldly possessions because money is often taken as like a uh, something which is uh, sinful. As a result, then, we think that when you take money away from these communities, you enormously hurt them. Secondly, they're massively interconnected, which is to say, you A, you live in obscurity, so you spend a lot of time together. B, 
be there's often a familial structure which is the same as patriarchs and stuff like this meaning that everybody is like tied in like family structures as a result when one person is getting sued that crushes the entire community financially because they all need to support you but also secondarily all the people within that community know each other they interact so that really really hurts as a result then we give the reasoning for why it's so bad that you need to change your incentive structure they say you likely liberalize because it's easier and because there's a signaling effect. You don't liberalize. Two um, levels to this response. A, counter incentives. Three reasons why you would not want to do this. Actually, there's five. Two are mentioned by Ruben. One, economic harms. Two, birth rates being like necessarily high. But three further ones. One, it's against your religion. So there's just a big risk versus reward. If you you go and sin, then you risk like heaven versus hell. That's a much bigger margin in the eternity of the afterlife versus the present day. Second reason is a fear of a slippery slope. The Bible condemns like homosexuality if you have to like go and like teach people that they can like, use whatever pronouns they want then you fear that any other part of your practice will be cracked down on before give the third uh, mechanism or actually fifth i'll take the poi emoji go yeah, so there seems to be an inconsistency in your case. On one hand, the root springer currently exists because leaders are afraid of instability, which is why they're willing to liberalize mm -hmm. a little bit. But suddenly, when we pressure them slightly more on our side, they roll back on all the liberalization. They can it's them not slightly more. I've already given brain. all of the reasons for like the last few minutes as to why it's like quite a significant harm. Also, additionally, we think that um, you're likely to pull back preemptively because of the risk war calculus being so great, right? Like I've just spent like several minutes framing this. The third reason for why you're uh, you're unlikely to want to liberalize because leader authority you just lose it if you like buy into the state and bow to them weighing these incentives against opening government on their thing that it's easier this is assertive at best our incentives are more approximate on signaling we think that um given that life without a lot of assets is already the norm we don't think that you actually care about your amish museum that much when compared to hell but also secondarily um because um a lot, a lot of your money comes from you being insular and a circus act is particularly important the last thing they say is just the principle um the, we're just going to weigh off this principle right this applies to the small group of people who they say it's a small additional harm however they don't show why all harm you should be able to sue for for instance i can't say i can't sue the state for like educating me a certain way they indoctrinated me as well it's hard for me to leave on this way then we access scale intensity and uniqueness and so co we beat og and short crosses out we win the debate thank you all the teams um